Me again. In this, the third part of these electronic wave function videos, we focus on the angular nodes using boundary surface diagrams. We know the S orbital doesn't have any angular nodes, but the P and D orbitals have one and two respectively. We'll then connect the angular nodes to the angular momentum of the orbitals and also discuss the magnetic quantum number, which quantifies the multiplicity of a given orbital. We'll then look at some rather fancy boundary surface diagrams for hydrogenic wave functions that show both the radial and the angular nodes together. And we'll conclude with a very brief discussion of reality, which is the time dependence of the electronic wave functions. We now turn to the angular component of the electronic wave functions and look at their angular dependence and the implications for the phases of the wave function. While the principal quantum number n determines the energy and size of the orbitals, l, the orbital quantum number, determines the shape and also the angular momentum of an electron within that orbital. At an angular node, the wave function changes sign with angle and the number of angular nodes is equal to the orbital quantum number L. So for the S orbital, where L is equal to zero, there are no angular nodes, and the sign of the wave function is the same throughout the orbital. For the P orbitals, with L equals one, there's one angular node, and across that node, psi changes sign. And then when we go to the d orbital with l equals 2, there are two angular nodes. Here are the angular nodes for the p orbitals, where there is one nodal plane, shown here for the px, py, and pz. And across that plane, we see a change in color in my boundary surface diagram, which indicates the change in phase. For d orbitals, l equals 2, there are two nodal planes. And while we won't get into these in detail, again, you should have seen these in freshman chemistry before, just shown here for the five different d orbitals. Here are the two nodal planes. Again, across each one, there is a change in the sign of the wave function. Actually, for the 3dz squared, it's not a nodal plane, but a nodal cone. Let's take a look at the angular nodes in a 2p orbital, where there is one angular nodal plane, shown here in yellow, and across that plane there is a change in the sign of the wave function, represented here by a change in the color of my boundary surface diagram. Here is a plot in green of the wave function for the 2p orbital. We can see first, across the nodal plane, there's a change in the sign of the wave function. Here we have a positive amplitude. The nodal plane passes through the nucleus such that on the other side, that amplitude changes to a negative sign. Now if we square the wave function to get the probability density, we see that there is no probability density at the angular node. So again, there is no chance of the finding the electron at that particular point. And in this case, that angular node goes right through the nucleus. Psi squared has symmetric maxima either side of the nodal plane, and so there's equal probability of finding the electron on either side of the plane. For the RDF, from before we know that there are no radial nodes, so here's the RDF for the 2p orbital. And so now my boundary surface diagram, which gives the shape of psi squared, shown here. I can also include the colors, or I could just add positive and negative signs to indicate the change in phase of psi 2p across the nodal plane. And again here I've used some fancy shading just to show the change in the probability density, reflecting the change in the RDF with R. And so here the peak 
of the RDF is meant to coincide with the darker shading. My BSD will show two things, the shape of the orbital and by adding colors or positive and negative signs, I can show the change in phase of psi across any nodal planes, in this case an angular node. Let's just briefly talk about the angular momentum of the orbitals. The orbital angular momentum, uppercase L, is zero for a sphere. There is no directionality. However, it increases as L increases. The reason for this is that the density distribution concentrates along either an axis for the p orbitals or along a plane for the d orbitals and indeed for the f orbitals. And so as L increases, I go from zero angular momentum for the S orbital, and that progressively increases as I go from P to D to F. And I can quantify the angular momentum should I should desire to do so. We won't be getting involved in this through this equation. We haven't really mentioned too much about the magnetic quantum number, m sub L, Suffice it to say that it reflects or indicates the orientation and multiplicity of the orbitals. And the number of orbitals with a given L is actually equal to 2L plus 1. So for L is 0, there's 1 orbital. For L is 1, we have the 3P orbitals. For L is 2, we have 5D orbitals. L is 3, we have 7F orbitals, etc., etc. It also reflects the direction of the angular momentum vector. We've seen that boundary surface diagrams represent the shape and radial extent of the probability density psi squared. We've also seen that we can add color or signs to our BSDs to reflect changes in the phase of psi at an angular node but also at a radial nodes. Here's a gallery of pictures of different orbitals for hydrogenic wave functions. These are far fancier versions than the ones I've shown previously, but in each case, if you take a look at them, the changes in intensity and color will reflect those changes in phase and probability of finding the electron at certain angles and certain values of R. Here's another image taken from the reference shown, the so-called Orbitron Gallery of Atomic Orbitals. More complicated drawings, but the shading reflects all of the key principles of the wave functions, their radial extent and the nodes that we have discussed before. Although a subject usually reserved for higher level quantum mechanics courses, I think we should at least be aware that the electronic wave functions are not static, they're dynamic and have a time dependence. So for our orbitals, while they have a constant energy, their phase and amplitude oscillate with time. We can calculate this frequency of oscillation. It's just equal to the, their energy divided by the value of Planck's constant. So for example, for a 1s orbital, a hydrogenic one, where the energy is minus roughly 14 eV, that frequency is about 1.3 times 10 to the 17 per second. This represents how often the phase of the wave function, the sine of the wave function, goes through a full 2 pi cycle. For example, in this picture here, for a 1s orbital, while the wave function may initially be positive, it is oscillating through a full cycle and becomes negative, then positive, and then negative, etc. And this oscillation has a very rapid frequency. Let's look at this down at the bottom here for my p orbital. Here's my static view representing the shape and the phase, well, in reality, these change. They oscillate backwards and forwards. We will not let this concern us in our future considerations of how sine is important 
in overlapping wave functions. But for a reality check, I think it's an important point.